Good afternoon, everyone. Pastor Ed Anderson here. Welcome to the Revelation Prophecy Seminar. Um, you know, we're going to continue going on with our Revelation Seminar series in spite of the fact that um, everybody is lifting their restrictions. Um, the, we've had a lot of uh, folks from around the country and um, a lot of those uh, individuals from um, around the world has been really tracking these YouTube videos and uh, these seminars. So we're going to continue on with these in spite of the fact that everyone is lifting their 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 band. So um, welcome everyone. And uh, before we begin, I like to start with the word of prayer. Father in heaven, we just want to thank you for giving us the ability of meeting this way through technology. We want to ask now, Lord, for your Holy Spirit to give us understanding as we take a look at scripture and what it has to say about heaven. So Lord, we pray for these things and thank you for hearing this prayer and answering it. In Jesus name we pray it. Amen. So I don't know how many of you um, remember growing up with TV shows like Star Wars and Star Trek. And, um, you know, I grew up in the 19, um, uh, when I started watching TV and remembering it, it was around the 1970s and 1980s, of course. I, I was already a teenager. And, um, you know, whenever um, shows like Star Wars, for example, one of the biggest franchises in movie history, uh, made it on the movie screens, it was blockbuster because everybody seemed to be ignited with this fascination of traveling beyond our planet and exploring the unknown, going out into space and just visiting maybe other worlds. You know, Star Trek had this this um, motto as you would hear the theme song come on you know dun, 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 you know and um space the final frontier um let's see if i can remember the rest of it um something about to boldly go where no one has gone before you know that that kind of that kind of um language elicited this fascination to uh reach out into the beyond and um you know, just explore the idea about maybe visiting alien races. And, you know, even today, people are really excited when they when they hear about UFOs and the possibility of, um, you know, um, other created beings that come and visit our planet. And the question is, is why? You know, well, there, there's really a reason for this. And it's really a God-given reason. And that is because Jesus implanted deeply within the human heart a desire to live in space um, because he plans space living space travel uh, for his people and we're going to talk about um, a time when god is going to come and come from space and take us beam us up <laughs> so to speak and uh, we will be journeying through space to a heavenly kingdom somewhere set up out there in the universe and um that that desire that fascination is planted deeply because god put it there he wanted us all humans to realize that we're not alone that we are um a part of a larger picture and that picture includes jesus god angels and um, other created beings so with that in mind why don't we go ahead and let's just jump right into this fascinating um, study and let's take a look at what the bible says about revelation's amazing space city all right so we're going to start first by taking a look at what the bible says um, our heavenly home would actually be like so we start this off by looking at Hebrews chapter 11, verse 16. What has God prepared for his people? And so the Bible is really straightforward in the New Testament. When we ask the question, what did God prepare for his people? He says that God is preparing a city. So, um, you know, it's really funny. Uh, just the other night, I couldn't sleep. And so I was um, kind of scrolling through netflix to see what are the top shows that people are watching because I'm, I'm i'm planning on doing a sermon series on um top show themes and uh, it's kind of a fun little thing that i want to do um uh, you know in the future 
and I came across this um, really popular Netflix show called The Song Ballad of something. It's like a country western thing. And um, in one of the episodes of this series, um, this cowboy gets shot and it shows him floating in heaven, strumming a, uh, a harp and with little wings fluttering in the sky. And he's singing the song. And um, is that really what God says we're going to be doing when we die? Well, no. It says that um, he's going to come again, we rest, and then he's going to take us. And there's this description of a heavenly city. So here in Hebrews, we see that God is preparing this heavenly city that will come. Um, and that's where we will dwell. Now, what is the name of that city? So the city, you know, for example, um, the capital of the United States, of course, is Washington, D.C., and the, that's the name of our capital. Every state has a capital. I live in Arizona. The capital is Phoenix. And um, in Los Angeles um, or California, the um, people often wonder, what is the capital of California? And people will say San Francisco or Los Angeles or San Diego. It's none of those. It's actually Sacramento. So what is the capital city of heaven? And that's where we're going to be taken, to the capital. And the name of that city, according to Revelation, is called the New Jerusalem. Now, it's not the old Jerusalem because we know that there is a Jerusalem right now in Israel. It's not that Jerusalem. It is a new Jerusalem that God himself built. Now, what happens to the new Jerusalem at the close of the 1,000 years of Revelation found in chapter 20. So we see in Revelation 21, verse 2 and 10, and this is a review from last week, that this city, New Jerusalem, comes down out of heaven and descends to earth. Okay, where will this colossal space city land? All right, it says that at the site of the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem. Now, at the second coming, Jesus comes for his saints. We saw that last week in John chapter 14, verse 2 and 3. It's not until after the end of that 1,000-year millennium that Jesus will come, and here's where we discovered the third coming. So if you're not familiar with all that, make sure you see last week's um, lecture that we did. So at the third coming, at the close of the 1,000 years, that is when he will come with his saints. So we will be the first time when he comes or the second coming, he'll be with his angels. The third time when he comes, it'll be in the city with the saints and the angels and God. OK, so in Zechariah chapter 14, verse five, we read about that. Uh, the saints are inside the holy city. And as it descends, Jesus steps onto the Mount of Olives which is before Jerusalem, and it creates and flattens out a great plain which the city will, will descend upon. And that's in Zechariah chapter 14, verse 10. And this is just a review from last week. So here we see God's holy city, which is the new Jerusalem. Okay, it lands on this newly created plain. Now, the city is perfectly square. All right, perfectly square. What is the distance around the city? So Revelation 21 Verse 16, it gives us a measurement of the size of the city. And according to that, it says that the city measures by the outside wall circumference a furlong, um, 12,000 furlongs. Now, a furlong is approximately about, um, when you measure it according to our standard, one-eighth of a mile. So when you take a look at the distance circumference of the city, it is 1,000 500 miles according to the measurement a man now of course we know that those measurements were based on normal humans this is a city that was based on god so who knows how long that kind of furlong might be but if you use even just our standards of measurement today this city 1500 miles okay would be approximately 140,000 625 square miles, which is more area than the states of Virginia, the District of Columbia, Pennsylvania, Maryland, New Jersey, Rhode Island, and Vermont together. If you took all of those states on the East Coast and put them together, that would be about the size of just the New Jerusalem, just the city, okay? 
Um, so it's going to be unbelievably gigantic. And when you take a look at how many people you can put in that kind of square mile area, you're talking about approximately 39 billion people could live just in that area of the city, okay? So this is 10 times the world's present population right now. Okay, so let's take a look at the um, structure of the heavenly city. So what else does the book of Revelation say about this amazing city? So we go to Revelation 21, verse 10 through 27. So we're gonna, I'm going to highlight 17 different um, verses here that really gives a description of what the heavenly city is going to be like. So this is a great time right now to let your, your mind just kind of like um, go crazy on the imagination of what it might be. Okay, so take a blank canvas and let's start to paint a picture of what the heavenly city would be like. First of all, it's going to have light and the light is going to be the glory of God. Okay, so it has the glory of God. Um, then we are told that the wall is made of jasper. Okay, and it's approximately 144 cubits high or it equals about 200 and 16 feet okay now I want you to remember that 144 cubits is 216 feet 216 feet that's the wall okay that's the size the the, the height of the wall okay it has 12 gates okay so you see the wall 216 feet it has three gates on each side so there's a perfect square three gates to the north three gates at the south three gates at the east, three gates at the west side of the city. And the each gate is made of a single pearl. Now, I want you to think about that. If the wall is 216 feet high and the gate is there equal to that size of the wall and, and the gate is made of a single pearl, imagine how big that pearl is. Now, as you get that picture, you're thinking, oh my goodness, that is just a 216 foot pearl. Imagine the clam that it took to make that pearl. <laughs> okay, that's going to be like crazy large. Okay, so this already, you're not even in the city yet, and you're getting a vision of just how massive the city is. Okay, then it, we are told that the city has 12 foundations. Now, today in our homes, today we have a concrete foundation. That's it. We have one foundation. Maybe some homes, I don't know anything about construction. Maybe those of you who do construction, you can tell me um, better, but maybe the foundations today on really good homes might have like a rock layer and then sand, then you put whatever else on top of that, then you put concrete, and then you put a plastic liner. But, you know, all that stuff is maybe no bigger than one to two feet, maybe? Is that how? I don't know how construction works. This city, though, has 12 foundations, and each foundation is made of solid precious stones. So if light were to shine through it from the foundations of the city, it'd be shining all of these amazing colors that are gleaming through precious stones like red, sapphire, um, blue, um, purple, violet, orange, yellow, amber, all of these various um, um, stones that are emitting a, a prism of light coming through the foundation of the city. Okay, then we are told that the streets are made of not gold, but pure gold. Now, you know, today, um, the standard of currency and wealth among nations is actually um, weighed against the value of gold. And, you know, whenever you get like a gold chain, a gold ring, or anything gold, it's considered extremely highly valuable. Like I challenge you to go out and buy one gold coin one eighth ounce you're going to be spending over three hundred dollars just for a small tiny little piece of gold if you wanted to get a one ounce thing of gold you're paying over a thousand five hundred dollars just for a little gold coin now here in the heavenly city gold that's the that's what our streets are made out of okay it's like we're going to be saying oh yeah gold that's what my streets are made out of it's going to be so prevalent out there it's going to be so precious so the foundations are, are rubies and sapphires and emeralds and all diamonds. And then the, the streets have gold. 
That's what we're going to be walking on. And then there will be no need of a sun or a moon. Even though we might have a sun or a moon, there's no need for that light because the glory of God and his light is actually prevailing throughout the entire city. Then we are told that there will be no night. All right, there shall be no night there. So um, no more darkness, no more fear, no more um, wondering what 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 is in the dark because we will be living in the glory of God. Now, what's really fascinating is, you know, when you think of heaven, like I mentioned when we started this, you know, cowboy gets shot, he's floating on clouds with little wings, and then that's it. Our vision of heaven is clouds with harps, maybe coming through pearly gates, uh, a pearly one single pearly gate with Saint Peter there. Well, already the Bible changes our whole paradigm on what heaven is like because there it says it is a, a humongous city with three gates on each side. So that means there's 12 gates around the city. Each gate is made of a pearl, okay? So not bars, but a single pearl. You're going to walk through that. You're going to be walking on gold with the foundation of all these precious stones. And then it says that there is a source of water. Okay, so what is the source of the city water supply? So in Revelation 22, verse 1, we're looking at the river of life, the river of water of life that flows from the throne of God. So at the center of the, of the city is the throne of God. And from the throne of God, if you read a description in there, it says that there's a rainbow over the throne of God. So there's moisture the light from God's glory is, is creating a prism, a, a rainbow, a covenant. Um, and the water is coming through and it's flowing through the city of God. Okay, so we're going to have a great city. Now, the, the water flows through and then what miraculous tree, which Adam and, ate, uh, Adam and Eve ate before sinning, will be restored in that holy city. So in Genesis chapter 3, we read about that tree. But in Revelation 22, verse 2, it says that it's going to come back. It's going to be recreated, and it's going to be restored in the heavenly city. It will be the tree of life. So now this picture doesn't do justice, but I want you to imagine these branches, is go they're going to meet at the top. Because what it says is that the heavenly city, well, from the throne, it'll have the river of life. It's going to flow through the heavenly city, and then it's going to come under the roots of the tree of life. Okay, so this massive tree of life is going to be there and if the river of life will flow right through the bottom now i don't know if you can see in this picture but notice all the people on the bottom there this is how big the roots are and you notice there's angels at the at the bottom of the tree of where the roots are on each side of the river of life and um i don't know this this is an artist's rendition of of what he imagines um heaven what it might look like so there you see the, the tree of life with several fruit, and we're going to talk about that in just a second here. There's um, the people who were brought to heaven. That's us. We're there at the river of life, drinking the river of life, eating the fruit of the tree of life. And there in the distance, we see the city of God. And um, um, this artist, uh, I guess, thought that he would stick um, the Abraham Lincoln Memorial <laughs> <laughs> reflecting off the river of life, <laughs> looking like the Roman Senate or something. I, I don't know. Maybe that's a memorial to, um, I, I have no idea, but it's still going to be awesome. I don't know. I Maybe I we need to get another artist to recreate maybe a, a Star trek -y or Star Wars-y type of um, Naboo kind of looking <laughs> building but uh, i love this study because i love my i have a very active imagination i can imagine myself um you know i have a uh, a friend of mine her name is uh, um i call her sister karen and she works for it is written the television program and she always says that she wants us to meet her at gate 11 in the city of life and uh if sister karen is actually watching this right now um um, I, I will meet you at gate 11 when we get to heaven, but I always tell everyone who I know, all of my church members, my friends, my family, that I will see you at the tree of life and we're going to climb the roots of the tree of life and we are going to go diving because I'm from, my family's from Hawaii. I love water sports. I'm going to dive into the river of life and I'm going to go um, scuba diving and snorkeling with great wells there that are in that river of life. So meet me at the tree of life, okay? <laughs>
<laughs> oh man, Abraham Lincoln Memorial. All right, the tree of life. All right, let's talk about that. It bears 12 kinds of fruits. So every month it's going to yield a different crop. So, you know, right now I'm growing things here in Arizona. I have these little greenhouse. I'm growing like snow peas. I'm growing corn. I'm growing um, blueberries, blackberries, all this kind of thing. Okay, it takes forever to grow. And I, I seem to do well in the germination process, but then it all of a sudden dies. And I'm, I'm trying to learn how to grow things in Arizona. Well, imagine in heaven. Okay, you and I are going to meet at the Tree of Life on January. And there we're going to see that the first crop of fruit is going to be awesome mangoes. <laughs> okay, so we're going to eat those mangoes. Then we're going to say, all right, uh, I'll, I'll see you later. Let's go check out that planet. Um, I'll, I'll meet you back here in February. So we come back and now the, the fruit is papaya. Okay, and we're going to be eating that papaya. And then we'll say, okay, let's go check out the rings of Saturn. And okay, I'll meet you back here. And then we come back in March and now it's oranges. And every month we come back. 12 different kinds of fruit. Now, what purpose does this tree serve? Okay, so Revelation 22 verse 2 give us a very detailed reason why the tree of life is bearing all this fruit. And there's a, a, a specific purpose. And that is the leaves are for the healing of the nations. This is the place where all of the nations will come together from earth. You know, right now we're so separated by wars and by starvation. And right now the pandemic and you know, you're either an American or you're a Brit or you're Australian or you're Chinese or you're North Korean. You know, in heaven, there's none of that. This is why I keep telling you every week. Why do we keep separating ourselves by denomination? Why do we keep separating ourselves by Muslim and Jew and Christian and Hindu? Why do we keep saying that I'm Indian and American? Because that's what we placed on ourselves we we are the ones who created that separation but in heaven god only sees people for the human genetic dna if you're human and you've had a relationship with jesus then you're god's children and we're going to come together meeting at the tree of life with the river of life flowing underneath and we will be healed okay we're going to be one people eating that mango that papaya that guava that orange, that apple, and whatever fruit that you, you can imagine. Maybe there's fruit that we've never even imagined. Like if I was in Philippines and I saw fruit, dragon fruit, a tea, there's um, lychee. There's all these different fruits that I never even heard of in the United States. Okay, longzonis. Okay, um, maybe there's fruit in heaven that no one on the planet has ever seen before. I know that I've never seen the fruit from the tree of life. You know, the fruit that Adam and Eve ate. Okay, so we're going to definitely see that. And there we're going to meet together in heaven and the leaves will be for the healing of the nations. But more than that, um, it says there in Genesis that when we eat it, we it is actually the source of eternal life. So it seems clear that the leaves and the fruit provide an antidote for death. There's going to be no more death, no more tears, no more pain or sorrow. The reason is because we're drinking from the river of life. You know, um, there. who is it? Ponce de, uh, de Leon who is trying to find the river, the fountain of youth. The fountain of youth is going to be in heaven, the river of life. It's flowing from the throne of God. Um, the tree of life that gave perpetual immortality that Adam and Eve got to eat. That's going to be recreated. We're going to be eating that fruit. Okay, so we're going to be living forever because it's very clear the Bible says that the antidote to death is being in the presence of God and eating and drinking from the fruit and the river and from the tree of life. Um, so we're going to have eternal youth. So, you know, I don't know how, how I might look when I'm in heaven. I'm pretty sure I'll have 20-20 vision and I won't have this uh, crazy arm problem that I have. It's, by the way, it's getting better um after a lots of like healing but in heaven we're not going to have any of that those of you who are watching right now you're saying oh man i can barely move well when you're in heaven you're going to be running and i'm going to be racing you uh your your best friend will probably be a cheetah and you'll be saying you'll, you'll be saying come on cheetah catch up and the cheetah saying i can't i, I you're going too fast <laughs> slow down <laughs> you know so or some of us will be lifting boulders and we'll say let's play catch and you guys are picking up these massive 15 ton boulders and playing catch with these things. It's like, you know, I don't know. Heaven is going to be awesome. And we're going to, we're going to be spending an eternity just checking out the rest of the universe, 
hanging out with God, hanging out with the angels, just trying to understand everything. Like if you think that you are, are studying physics and biology and chemistry and understanding the mysteries of the universe right now in our feeble minds where we, we gather knowledge for 70 to 80 years, imagine what you will um, accomplish in 10,000 years. Okay, studying with a with a hundred percent usage of our brains, um, and being in access to the angels and other created universe, and man, it's going to be mind blowing. I'm just I'm super excited about this. Okay, Romans chapter eight verse eighteen tells us something very important. How do the things which God is preparing for us compare with the sufferings which we must pass through here on the earth? So when we when we compare what we're dealing with now with this pandemic or the the you know, there's these murder hornets, um, there's these killer bees now, there's these massive, you know, these locusts about this big, um, eating up all the vegetation in, in Africa. Um, you know, how do these things of suffering compare to what God is preparing for us in heaven? Well, Romans says they're not worthy to be compared. You can't even imagine what God is preparing in heaven because what you're experiencing now is no comparison to what God is preparing. It's kind of like comparing mud to comparing a nice lush metal with flowers. It's like, you know, color, smell, everything is different. Okay, so that likewise, heaven like that is to us what we're comparing on earth. Okay, so let's take a look at our new world now. So in lesson seven, we learned, and then this was last week, we learned that when the holy city descends to earth at the close of that 1,000 years found in Revelation chapter 20, which we call the millennium, the wicked will be raised and Satan will lead them in an attempt to capture the holy city. Okay, so there Satan is going to be able to deceive the nations again, as we discovered from last week. What happens to them? So in Revelation chapter 20, verse 9, we discover that they are devoured by this fire. Okay, so what I'm doing right now is just a quick review. Now, what else does the fire accomplish in addition to devouring Satan his evil angels, and all the wicked. So in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10, we see that the world, the elements are melted with fervent heat. So when we're talking about the elements, we're talking about the periodic table. So those of you who took chemistry, um, when you break down all matter in life, everything in the universe, everything on earth, like I can take, for example, this back scratcher, which is made of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, okay? molecules so i can i can take this and break it down if you burn it into its elements okay and it's very elements by the way those of you are saying wow pastor ed has a back scratcher because <laughs> i have allergies i have to use it to scratch my nose and scratch my back and everything okay no, i'm just kidding so the elements are going to be melted so it's going to be broken down into its basic atoms the basic nuclear form okay so all you have are basically um electrons, neutrons, and protons. So the elements are melted with fervent heat. It's broken down to its basic element. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be all burned up. So in other words, it's going to go through a purifying process where everything is created and broken down or everything is broken down into its basic fundamental atomic form. Okay. Then at that point, what does God do? Well, in Revelation 21 verse 1 and 2 Peter Chapter 3, verse 13, if you go back and look at these verses, you'll discover that he begins to take these raw elements, these atoms, and begin to recreate new elements. He creates a new heaven. So we discovered this last week that the heaven that you see right now with um, Orion and the Pleiades and the Big Dipper and you know the Southern Cross, all of these constellations are going to be completely new. When you take a look at the sun, the sun is going to be completely new. The moon, everything, all the planets, the whole solar system and the galaxy, the whole universe is going to be recreated. So we're going to see completely brand new things. Who knows? Maybe when you wake up in the morning, I don't think we're going to be sleeping. But let's say, for example, we're taking a nap and we're chilling out after eating that humongous mango. And we're like on the, on the branches of the tree of life and we look up. And what we see in the sky is not a sun. What we see is a humongous blue and green planet with purple ring around it. Okay. I don't know what it's going to be like, but it's going to be awesome. Like it's just going to be mind blowing. Okay. God is going to create a new heaven and then he's going to create a brand new earth. 
So we are going to be witness to seeing God create the planet again. He's going to recreate um, the continents. He's going to separate the water from the earth. We're going to get a chance to see the creation of the universe and the heavens and the stars and all of that um, that dwells in them. Then we're going to get to see um, the planting of or the creation of vegetation and trees and and meadows. We're going to get to see the creation of mountains and we're going to get to see new creatures created, new fish, new fowl, new mammals, new reptiles, new amphibians. OK, the only thing that won't be recreated is humans because we're already created. We're going to be there with God. God is just creating um, a new heaven and a new earth where we will dwell. And the heavenly city is going to be the capital of that that new creation and it's going to be on the new earth the new jerusalem on new earth in the new heaven and who will live there will be the righteous okay we will be there okay where will god live after the holy city becomes the capital of the earth made new so where will god himself because you know right now god is somewhere out in the far reaches of the universe we we don't see him we don't we can't touch him but there, after the second coming, which is coming very soon, when all this comes to be, where will God himself be living? Jesus and God the Father will actually live right here on the earth, in the new Jerusalem, on the new earth, in the new heaven created. This will be his new place, his new home, his new capital. And his people, you and I, will be there with God. Isn't that amazing? Now, everyone will have a fabulous home in the holy city. OK, so you and I, we are act and there's actually a verse and we're going to get to that. Hopefully um, um, in future, we actually will talk about it here, but um, we're going to be um, in the country. But we also have a fabulous home in the holy city. And who builds that home? Well, we are told in. OK, look at this verse, John 14, verse two and three, that Jesus himself okay has built a home for us and you remember jesus was a carpenter and remember he um is making a home and the city has streets of gold and the walls of gold so so jesus who's the creator of everything he's creating homes for you and i so we're going to actually have a home in the heavenly city in the holy city the new jerusalem so let's talk about what heaven will be like now remember i told you that when you look at these cartoons or you watch these movies um, most people think that when we die, we're going to, or, you know, when things like that happen, we're floating on heaven with wings on clouds. Well, heaven is a real heaven made with real people. So let's talk a little bit about what that means. Okay. So what kind of bodies will the people who enter God's kingdom have? So in Philippians chapter three, verse 20 and 21, we are told that we will have bodies like Jesus. Okay, now what did what after Jesus' resurrection, what kind of body did he have? If we if we're gonna be resurrected and we're gonna have a body like Jesus, what did he have? So if you look at Luke 24, verse 36 to 43, we see something very fascinating. Jesus um had flesh and bones. He was able to eat, but he was not subject to physical laws because you remember the disciples were in that room talking about it, and then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, Jesus just pops up. So he didn't come in through the door. He didn't pop in through the window. He didn't fall through the roof. He just materialized. It's like he got beamed down from somewhere. And they thought that he was a ghost. And Jesus had to tell them, look, it's me. So he pointed to the scars in their hands. Thomas even went up and poked his, his finger in the hole in his, in his side. And so we're going to be able to recognize each other. We have flesh and bones. We're going to be able to hug each other in heaven. That's right. There's going to be no pandemics. We're not going to have to do social distancing in heaven. We're going to be able to shake hands and and hang out with each other. And, and you know, maybe we will be playing harps, but it's going to be with the bass guitar and a, and a guitar, a keyboard, and maybe a string section, you know. So we're going to have actual music, and it's going to be awesome. There's going to be a horn section there. You know, I grew up in the 1970s and 1980s, so... One of the favorite bands that I grew up as a youth was Earth, Wind, and Fire. You know what those horns like? Um, those of you who who like Earth, Wind, and Fire or uh, Cool in the Gang, you know what I'm talking about. The Commodores when you know they would sing like you know um, songs like uh, my my daughters love to dance and and they love to move 
to the music of Earth, Wind, and Fire. And and every time those horn sections go, ba da ba ba da ba, you know, they all, ooh, it's all like a big party for them. Well, like in heaven, we're going to have that. We're going to have flesh and bones. We're going to be able to eat. We're going to be able to um, to dance. We're going to be able to like play music and this time play it in tune <laughs> and sing and sing in tune. You know. <laughs> All right. What will the saints do on the new earth? Okay. What which demonstrate that we're real and not these ghosts? Well, in Isaiah 65, and you got to just read that whole chapter. Isaiah 65. I'm just pointing out verses 17, 20, 21, and 22. It says there that we're going to have um, a house in the city too, that we're going to build houses and inhabit them. So, you know, here, you know, God has been good because my wife and I were, we were able to buy a home and we have a home here, but you know, things are falling apart already. You know, I have to like replace um, an air conditioning condenser thingy um, and the paint is peeling you know, it's like, it's crazy. You know, it's like, I'm constantly have to do upkeep. Maybe you know what I'm talking about. Um, when we were, were living in Pasadena and I was uh, there in California, um, we uh, we had a little 800 square foot home that we we're paying $2,500 a month for. It was crazy. It was like it was so expensive for such a small rinky-dink house that was built in the 1930s. And um, here, we're going to have two homes. This is awesome. This is like the dream. Now, some of you all... Uh, you're saying, oh, I already got two homes. I got a country home. I got a cabin. and I got Okay, but you don't have a home that was made by God and whose walls are made of gold, right? And this this is going to be a designer home in the heavenly city just down the street from the throne room of God. I mean, that's cool, man, you know, where you're going to be able to like, you know, chill out at the river of life, the tree of life. And, you know, you're going to have like your your pet eagle and you're going to say, hey, let's go let's go visit Jesus. Give me a ride. And then you get to ride into like the place where God is. It's like, you know, I don't know. I'm just my, like I said, I have a wild imagination. OK, but we're going to have a second home. Isaiah says that we're going to be in the country and we're going to be building a home. So I don't know what my home is going to look like, but I guarantee you it's going to have some water elements. Um, and it's going to probably be on a mountain overlooking a scene somewhere. And I'm pretty sure it's not going to be on this planet. Maybe I want to build a home on a different planet. I don't know. You know, um, but look at this picture here. Um, there's some cows in the back and, and there's my mom and my sister who are planting flowers. <laughs> Jesus is there with me and I'm, I'm holding a, a plate. They put the wrong fruit in this picture because there's grapes, pears and oranges. Mine is going to have a mango, papaya and, and a big watermelon. OK, and Jesus is there hanging out with me. And of course, I'm going to have my pet lion and um, and he invited his friend, that little deer. OK, I mean, can you imagine? And there's Angela, my wife right there saying, all right, uh, Capri, go ahead and take the, the grapes from Jesus. I mean, and there's Karsten right there on the bottom saying, you know, when is it my turn? <laughs> I don't know what it's going to be like, but we're going to have two homes in heaven now. It says that we will be able to plant vineyards and eat the fruit. You know, to someone like me who kills everything I try to grow, this is like an amazing promise. I'm, in other words, I get to plant something and I actually get to see fruit. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, it's like I grow corn and all I have is like dead corn at um, stalks at the end. I try to grow tomatoes and all I have are half eaten caterpillar eaten tomatoes here in heaven i get to plant a vineyard and i actually get to eat whatever i grow <laughs> okay but this time it's going to be cool because i get to eat the fruit and i can go like this and the seed will go Woo! and plant in the ground and then a month later i get to see an orange tree and not wait like three years for for fruit to grow i don't know in heaven it's going to be awesome okay so how does paul describe the glories of god's new kingdom so, you know, when we think about this amazing city in space that God is going to create for us, Paul had a vision of what this new kingdom would look like. So if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, it tells us that I have not seen. OK, so in other words, if you've seen it with your eye, you haven't even come close to what God is preparing for you. Nor ear heard. In other words, if you can even imagine what I've told you and you heard it and you can imagine it. OK, neither have entered into the heart of man. If you can do that, OK, it's not even close 
to the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. So in other words, take everything in the imagination of George Lucas and Steven Spielberg and you and I and whatever we can imagine and then go beyond that 10 times more. And now maybe you're coming close to what God is preparing. I mean, that is absolutely insane when you think about what we're going to experience in the next several years when Jesus comes again. It's going to be awesome. No disease or death, okay? Because as you know, this is what we live in now, okay? What comforting and exciting facts about heaven are really emphasized in the following scripture passages? So take a look at these texts, and you can always go back, and you can write these and watch this over again, but write these verses down. Isaiah 35, Isaiah 65, and Isaiah 11 are really the key um, scriptures in the Old Testament. Then you go to Revelation 21 and you compare those up, okay? So compare Isaiah with the book of Revelation and you will discover something really interesting. There we see that the eyes of the blind shall be opened. Now, I really should be wearing glasses because it feels like I'm going blind. Every year I have a birthday, I go a little bit more blurry. Those of you who have blindness in heaven, our eyes will be open. You'll Imagine the first thing that you see are the amazing colors of heaven. Okay, we'll have perfect vision. We can see for, uh, you know, thousands and thousands of yards with crystal clarity. Okay, so our bodies are going to be different. Our ears, okay, the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. In other words, there'll be no deafness. You'll be in perfect working order. But this time you're probably going to have the ears of like the keenness of a dog where you can hear all the frequencies in the subsonic um, ranges. Your eyes will see in the UV light and the X-ray, gamma ray. I don't know. We'll be able to switch out our our eyes, you know, like like helmet, you know, seeing night thermal, you know, thermal imaging or whatever. Okay, ears. You'll be able to hear everything in the spectrum. Um, layman will leap as a heart. Okay, so I'm here goes my mind again. Imagine in this beautiful city, and you're sitting there kicking back with the family. You're eating this mango and you're just chilling out, talking to Jesus. And in the distance, you see this guy jumping, doing, 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 you know, and he's like, woo, woo, you know. <laughs> and, and then he stops by. I say, dude, what are you doing? And he says, well, when I was on earth, I couldn't walk. So I'm taking every advantage now to leap like a deer. <laughs> You know, it's kind of like awesome, man. You know, yeah, okay, go ahead and jump your way to the other side of the planet. <laughs> and then it says the tongue of the dumb shall sing. Okay, so these are people who couldn't talk on the planet. Now, not only are they talking, it's like, dude, stop talking already. It's like, okay, sing now. Okay, it's going to be like that. It's going to be awesome. I mean, people are going to be so changed. We're going to be so happy. And things like what we're experiencing here, we're never going to experience in heaven again. It says the tongue of the dumb, those who are who can speak, are going to be able to not only talk, but they're going to be able to sing. And they're going to sing gloriously and, on, and in pitch. Okay. Okay. And then here's the most important thing. Revelation 21, 4 says that God will wipe away all tears. It's not because um, we're not going to have tear ducts. It's not because we can't cry. What we're talking about here is we're not going to have any more sadness. We're not going to have any more fear, things that, that cause us to cry because of the sorrows. Okay, if we're going to have tears, it's going to be tears of joy. Okay, kind of like right now. Like right now I have tears, but I'm, I'm just imagining what it's going to be like because obviously you can tell this pandemic has had an effect on me because now I'm kind of going crazy. I'm imagining it happen. And I'm seeing, you know, I'm just reading the scripture and saying, man, I can't wait. I can't wait. How about you? It's like it's going to be awesome, okay? Now, no more death, no more sorrow, no crying, nor pain. That's, that's what we're talking about here because all of those things – all those former things are going to pass away. You know, last year, we just had the one-year anniversary of the passing of my father. And it's been sad, you know. We went and, and went, visited his grave um, last week. And, um, you know, it was sad, you know, because uh, we don't get the, the, the presence of my dad. But we have the hope that we're going to see him again. And my dad, I'm pretty sure he was already a strong man here on, on the planet. He's probably the guy who's going to be lifting those 15 um ton boulders and saying son let's play catch it's like okay dad all right throw it 
<laughs> and I'll duck and I'll have my brother uh, catch it. <laughs> okay, but there in heaven, I shouldn't fear anything, right? There's no more death. There's no sorrow, no crying or pain. That means that you and I, we can say, hey, let's go cliff jumping. You know, today, if I jumped off a cliff, I have to make sure I have a parachute or a glider. This time, we're going to run. And we're going to run off a cliff. And we're going to fly in the air. And there will be no more um, concern or worry for death because there's no death, sorrow, crying, or pain. So we're going to go, woo, and we're going to fall like about five miles down. And we're going to roll and tumble, and then we're going to run. I mean, it's going to be awesome the kind of things we're going to be able to do. Okay. Beast will not hurt nor destroy. Now, I don't know about you, but if you were to go wandering in the Alaska wilderness, you better make sure you're carrying a gun or bear spray. Because if you encounter a black bear... That black bear only sees you as one thing. He sees you as the next meal. In heaven, if you see a black bear, he'll probably end up talking back to you saying, hey, where is the local berry bush that you, have you seen one around? It's like, yeah, here, <laughs> you know. Um, in heaven, the wild beasts that, that, that normally we'd be fearful of, they're not going to hurt nor destroy. Isaiah 65 verse 25 says that. And then you get this vision of, okay, so now here we go with our imagination again. A wolf and a leopard and a lion will be led by a little child. So imagine these little calves, these little lions, okay? Then you see a wolf, a leopard, and a lion. What happens when you mix a wolf, leopard, and lion together with a cow and a, a, a sheep? You know, today on this planet, if you mix those animals together, the only thing you're going to have is a wolf, a leopard, and a lion, there won't be any more calves and sheep, okay? And if the lion is really hungry, you're only going to see a leopard and a lion because that wolf will be a meal, okay? So uh, in heaven, it's not going to be like that. Imagine a little child. So I imagine my little daughter Capri, a little two, three-year-old, and just kind of like wandering on the hill. And there she has a, a beautiful leopard with the spots, a massive lion, and maybe she's riding on the lion, and walking side by side with her is a massive dire wolf, you know, maybe six foot tall. And and there's a calf and a lion just kind of like, you know, frolicking along. And then you see this guy jumping in the distance like a, like a heart, like a deer, okay? And we're sitting there eating a mango saying, yep, I think I read about this somewhere in the book of Isaiah. Didn't they say something that this we would see this scene and we'd sit there and laugh because it's like we wouldn't believe it. It's like, yeah, that's crazy that we just saw this scene happen. Okay, that's what heaven's going to be like. Now, what promises has God given about heaven that applies to the tragedies of this present earth? So as we look at Isaiah 65, 17, we read that the former thing shall not be remembered nor come into mind. Now, we are going to, we're going to know where we came from but what it means here when it says it won't be remembered we're not going to dwell on those horrible memories um it's not that we're blocking them out it's just that we're going to be discovering so many brand new things every single day for eternity i mean just imagine how long it's going to take for us to just understand the new jerusalem then expand that beyond into the new earth okay that might take us ten thousand years just to understand all of that and, and hang out with god and discover the mysteries of godliness and and salvation and and that's just one planet we haven't even launched into the moon and to the other planets and visit other created worlds i mean all of the things that we're going to be doing in heaven and things we're going to be enjoying the things that we're dealing with right now is like a sliver a line on the overall eternity line that you and i are going to experience when we have that relationship with god and he comes back and takes us okay so eternal joy, eternal health. The prophet Isaiah gives us three more marvelous promises regarding the new earth. So as you take a look at Isaiah chapter 35, verse 1, and Isaiah 33, verse 24, and Isaiah 60, verse 18, we notice here that the desert will blossom as a rose. So I put this on here because I live in Phoenix, Arizona, in the desert. Now we have a beautiful desert here because during the springtime, the when um when the desert starts to bloom and man it's beautiful well here it says that the desert will blossom like a rose so there'll be if there's a desert it's going to have amazing light it's going to be colorful it's going to be beautiful okay and then the inhabitants of the city the new 
um, recreated humans who are living with God in the new Jerusalem, they will not say that they're sick. There's going to be no more sickness. So we don't have to worry about getting a coronavirus infection. We don't have to worry about Ebola. We don't have to worry about cancer or um, diabetes. We don't have to worry about all of the ailments that, that, um, that kill people every single year. Okay, and then it says that violence shall no more be heard in the land. You know, I can barely stand to read the news now. I just read of a report up in Scottsdale. It's a city north of us. It's where a lot of the rich people live. That um, some guy um, was breaking in to a home and the uh, father went in and um, this man was naked in his child's bedroom. So he took out a shotgun and shot him and killed him. Okay, there's so many like crazy things about that one story that just made my gut wrench. One, a guy broke in with the intent on hurting a child. Um, two, that child was terrified by the strange guy who was naked. Three, the guy was naked. I mean, you know, oh, and, and the story said that he was holding a, a, wood, a wood stick, like he was going to harm the girl. You know, it's just that part alone right there was just like gut wrenching. And then the guy heard the the dog barking he goes in and sees the scene so imagine the scene for yourself if you're a parent there's this all of a sudden panic like what the heck you know and you just go into this like mode of like protection right so i mean already it's a horrible it's one story but i have four horrible thoughts already about this then he gets a shotgun and blows a guy away with you know to protect the child and it's just the 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 blood and everything and the screaming and the crying. I mean, it's just a horrible situation. Well, in heaven, we won't ever have that again. No violence will be heard in the land. We don't have to be worried about locking our doors and putting security gates down. We don't have to worry about someone stealing or taking things. We don't have to worry about murder because we've already experienced that. We know what it was like. None of that is going to be in the new heaven and the new earth. Will people recognize each other or are we going to be these ghosts where it was like, oh, who are you again? And then you have to explain it to me. And it's like, oh, yeah, OK, yeah, but you look so different. OK, what do you think? Will people recognize each other in heaven or will we lose our identity? Well, 1 Corinthians 13, verse 12 in the New Testament, it says, then shall I know even also I am known. In other words, we're going to know God, um, Christ. We're going to know each other. You're going to know me. You're going to look at me and say, wow, Pastor Ed, I, man, it's so amazing that you made it. But man, you look way thinner and you look younger. <laughs> and I'm going to say, yeah, it's because your eyes are better now. <laughs> you know, but, you know, joking aside, we're going to know each other. We're not going to be these ghosts and we're not going to be saying like, you know, what is that little ghostly apparition? No, it's not going to be that at all. We're going to have facial features. We're going to have ears. We're going to be able to see. I'm going to be able to recognize my wife and my dad and, and my grandfather. And, and you guys are going to be able to recognize me. And I'm going to recognize you. I'm going to say, man, you're looking good. And you're going to say, yeah, look at, check me out. You know, I'm about 30 years younger and about 15,000 times stronger. It's like, yeah, let's let's go for a run. And, and you'll be running with that guy who's leaping in the hills. Okay. Oh, I don't know why I fixated on that guy. Okay, eternity is a long, long time, right? Will people ever become bored in heaven? We kind of talked and alluded to that. Well, Psalm 1611 actually gives an answer. Are we going to be bored in heaven? The answer is no. We're going to be in God's presence with fullness of joy. In other words, we're going to be discovering the secrets and the mysteries of godliness. We're going to be looking at the at salvation. How did God become man? The, the whole plan of salvation. We're going to get to look at the blueprint of that. We're going to look at the origins of Lucifer. We're going to look at the old videotapes of what happened on the planet. We're going to be exploring physics and biology and the mysteries of science. I mean, we're going to be able to walk on water. We're going to be able to like do crazy stuff like spit a mango seed out of my mouth and let it grow in one month and then try to figure out how that happened. You know, where on earth I can't even grow like a simple thing, you know. So we're going to be studying. We're going to be it's going to be awesome. We're, we're going to fill that whole time just in discovery and making new friends, meeting new people, meeting new created beings, hanging out with angels. But more importantly, hanging out with Jesus himself 
and actually going into the presence of God the Father. That would be pretty awesome. The verse goes on and says, we will have pleasures forevermore. Now, I love the way they say, and I put it in red, pleasures forevermore. Okay, there's a lot of things that give pleasure to humans, okay? Um, okay, you can let your mind go wild on that. And it's that kind of pleasure. It's everything from the physical pleasures, taste, sight, hearing, um, the way we touch, the way we feel, the way we experience things, those kind of pleasures. You know, a lot of people love going to the theater, live theater, because they're moved. And, you know, there's some some um, theatrical shows I love going to. And I come out of there and I'm crying and I'm so moved. And I'm saying, you know, I feel like I'm a better person for being there and watching that, getting that point. You know, like how I felt when I first watched, um, um, you know, um, Star Wars and The Return of the Jedi. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, you know, it's 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 just challenging things like being challenged with our minds and having pleasure is not only physically but mentally and emotionally and and bringing out that joy and bringing out that that hope and that that vision that we can accomplish things and build things and you know um you know we're going to be in the city planting we're going to be in the city building but this time it's going to be awesome because the things that we're going to be building is going to be actually really cool and not not uncool okay in other words it's not going to be rickety and stuff like that i just built a cattery for our bengal cats man that thing is so rickety i mean i'm surprised that i can keep the cats in because our our alpha male cat finds every which way to get out of this cattery um in heaven we're not going to have to build a cattery all i have to do is just call um my animal friends and they'll just come and then we just hang out and we take off so pleasures man it's going to be awesome just all the things that we're going to be able to do. If you're into running, imagine running around the planet. If you're into swimming, imagining, imagine swimming. I'm a scuba diver. I love to scuba dive. I'm going to hang out down there and I'll scuba dive and see all the beautiful colors and all the fish and maybe even talk to the animals like Aquaman or something, you know? I don't know. If we can imagine it, we can probably do it in heaven. Okay. Clearly, I had way too much fun on this study. Who will the redeemed be like and who will be their constant companion? So let's get back into the scripture on this before I get too much into the movies of DC Comics and Marvel. 1 John chapter 3, verse 2 and Revelation 14, 4 tells us that we will be like Jesus. We will be like him. Then we are also told that these follow the lamb whithersoever he goeth. So just think of it. We're not only going to be like Jesus. But we're going to be Jesus's constant companion. In other words, imagine all of the universe, all the angels, all the world beings that were created who want to hang out with God and hang out with Jesus. But guess what? If they want to have an audience with Jesus, they're going <laughs> to there's going to be a human hanging out with them. OK, and these other creative beings are going to say, wow, that's crazy. You're a human. Tell me, what was it like to live on the planet? And you're going to say, oh, oh, you don't want to hear that story. But, okay, let me tell you, how much time do you have? You know, oh, I got an eternity. Okay, well, that's how long it's going to take me. And you give them 10 minutes. And then let's go talk about something else now. Okay, so just imagine, we're going to be hanging out with Christ himself. Wherever Jesus goes, that's where we're, where we're going to go. That's where we're going to want to go. Jesus is going to say, hey, everyone, how about we go check out um this planet here um i heard that they're having this big banquet feast and they're going to be making this really cool dish and i've never tried it before but why don't we go check it out and we'll say yeah let's go do it and so we'll bust that party down we're going to go visit that planet and there's going to be like a million of us showing up and we're going to bust that party and we're going to have this massive joyful banquet party so i'm looking at this picture here look at these angels they're blowing the trumpet so when jesus appears they're, they're going to be these trumpets blowing Woo! You know, God is here and, and all the that that plan is going to be rejoicing. And then Jesus comes in. And there's a million of us saying party time. <laughs> and they're going to say, cool, that's awesome. I'm glad you came. We have a lot of food. Join us. I mean, if your mind can imagine it, we're going to be doing it. I'm just I'm just looking forward to that time when I don't have to worry about stuff like I worry about here on the planet and um, dealing with all the stuff that we have to deal with here on the earth. Woo! Wow. 
This is crazy, man. The stuff that we have to deal with on this planet. And look at the stuff that God has prepared for us. Sin. Sin is one thing that can keep me out of God's kingdom. This is why we need to have a relationship with Jesus. What can be done about it? 1 John 7 and 8 and Revelation 1, 5 tells us that the blood of Jesus Christ's son cleanses us from all that sin. Friends, if you want to be a partaker, if you want to be a part of what I just described to you, it's so easy. All you have to do is go to Jesus and say, Lord, you know, I've never done this before, but I want to believe. Please take my life the way I am and cleanse me from my unbelief, from my doubt. Take me just as I am. And you know what? Jesus is going to come in and he's going to answer. Jesus will freely and lovingly cleanse you if you request it. He's not going to barge in, into your life. You have to go to him because he gives you that free will choice. Will you ask him right now? Will you ask him to cleanse you and, and start that relationship with him so that way you and I can be in heaven and you can see your loved ones that you miss so much, that you can see a new life in this new earth, this new heaven and be with Jesus? Are you willing to do that? If you are willing to do that, let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we just pray now with every person who is praying at this moment that you will bless them with the Holy Spirit. Right now, Lord, we are asking that you cleanse us from all our sins, our doubts, all of our um, reasons that we might have to not believe. And we pray, Lord, that you will clear those things and bless us with the spirit of understanding and faith and hope and belief. Father, we ask this right now, very simply, in the name of your son, Jesus, we, we pray for this very simple prayer in your name. Amen. All right. Man, this was an awesome lesson. I had a really good time with this one. All right, let's do a quick quiz. The name of the glorious city that God made for the redeemed that will travel through space is the New Jerusalem. Is that true or false? Okay, question two. The streets of that city are made of gold. Okay, so after all of my descriptions, these are really simple, easy questions. The wicked are destroyed when they try to take the city according to Revelation 20. So that's from a review question from last week. Is that true or false? Okay, here's another one. God promises that the tragedies of this present world will not come into the minds of the redeemed after sin is eliminated. True or false? And my last question, eternity is a long, long time and there is the possibility that some of us might actually get bored. True or false? Okay, let's look at the question, the answers. The name of the glorious city that God made for the redeemed that will travel through space is New Jerusalem. And of course, that is true. We get to actually fly in that space ship in New Jerusalem. Okay, so that's going to be awesome. The streets of that city are made of gold. And that is true. Gold is so valued today, but in heaven, that's just our streets. Okay. <laughs> The wicked are destroyed when they try to take the city, according to Revelation 20. And that is true. That is a review question. So again, if you missed that one, go back and read, uh, watch the video from last week. God promises that the tragedies of this present world will not come into the minds of the redeemed after sin is eliminated. We're not going to dwell on it. So the answer is true. Okay. And finally, eternity is a long time. And there is the possibility that some might get bored. And I, my answer to that is... False. Are you kidding me? There's going to be so much that we're going to be doing there. It's going to be awesome. I know some of you are actually bored right now being in quarantine, but man, imagine being able to go out, hang out with people, your best friends, play Monopoly, eat mangoes, watch this guy jump around, um, hang out with these kids who are leading all these animals around. And that's just hanging out for an afternoon in my patio at my country home. Okay. That is my alarm. Um, that um, it's time to pray. <laughs> so um, as you know, I have these three alarms. I try to um, really keep a life like Daniel and pray three times a day. So that one there is my prayer to uh, let there be praise, let there be joy from above. So that's my reminder. Praise God for all that we do. Uh, you ought to do that too. You know, it's a good reminder, good, good thing to do.
Okay, so where are we? Next week, we are going to take a look at our next lesson, which is a warning, the four horsemen of Revelation. Now, many of you um, have probably heard of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Um, they made movies out of it. A lot of um, people talk about the four horsemen of the apocalypse. So we're going to be looking at what Revelation says and what the Bible actually interprets the four horsemen of Revelation to be. So we're going to be looking at this next week. But until then, I just want to say God bless. I hope that you had a good time with me this, this um, afternoon. Um, looking at the study, this was an awesome study. Thank you for indulging me and letting my mind go crazy. Um, I do have, uh, you know, I'm a musician and I have uh, uh, a wild imagination. And when I read stuff like this in the Bible, man, I just love it because of all the crazy stuff that I've seen in my life. Um, so I'm looking forward to heaven. How about you? So until then, praise God for everything. Um, be safe out there. Um, study these scriptures. Go back and re uh, watch this video or go back and watch the last week's. Um, invite friends and family to come and join us um, if you are um, interested in sharing this good news um, that we're studying out of the book of Revelation with them. So um, until then, all I can say is God bless everyone. And um, until next time, um, just stay close, pray, study, and um, I'll see you next time. Bye.